God's word. We consider from this passage in Acts 25, 1 to 27, the topic, surrender in the face of injustice. Surrender in the face of injustice. Now, justice is something that the Bible speaks much about. The Lord Jesus, he came to fulfill God's justice. He came to bear the unfairness, right, to die so that God's wrath might be appeased. And he also came to offer mercy uh, to the repentant. Now, in Israel's justice system, there were provisions of mercy for the downtrodden. There was also equitable punishment for transgressors. So it was very, very good, the justice system, very just, very merciful. And if you compare it with other civilizations of that time, other civilizations were far worse in their idea of justice. Now, in the Egyptian book, the great edict of Haramheb in 1300 BC, uh, it describes the kind of punishments that the Egyptians would mete out. Criminals, they would have their noses cut off as a mark of humiliation, as a warning to others also. And such criminals without noses, they were sent to live in a far off city. And the Greeks actually had a name for this city. They called it Rhino Kalura, meaning the cut off the nose city, all right? Because everyone there did not have a nose. But even in such wicked systems of justice, uh, there were still a systems of appeals. You know, Queen Esther, we know, could appeal to King Ahasuerus, and this was the same here in Roman law. No one could be convicted or accused without due process. Even in Israel, if there were complex cases and a judge could not handle it, uh, it would be brought before a court of experts. So there was a hierarchical system, and this is what we experience here in Singapore. You know, you have the lower state courts, you have, uh, you know, district magistrate courts, you even have, uh, you know, specialized courts like the small courts of tribunal or whatever, right? But sitting on top is the Supreme Court, which is comprised of both the High Court and the Court of Appeals. And what this tells us in all of these systems built into humankind is that people by nature, they fight for justice. And we do know, we have to admit, that despite the best minds, despite the best intentions, justice will never be perfect on earth. Uh, This is something that we must recognize. You know, even in Israel, despite this superior justice system, there was a lot of injustice. There was a delay of justice as well. And what we as human beings, even as Christians, must realize is that uh, there is no true and lasting justice on earth. You know, some of us, some people will receive no apology, no compensation, no vindication in their entire lifetime. But then what should we do? You know, do we give up? Uh, Do we try and exhaust all recourse? Uh, Or do we place ourselves in God's hands? Now, we see Paul in this passage. He demonstrated three virtuous characteristics that all of us as Christians, as we seek for justice, ought to display. Firstly, bold wisdom is needed in the face of uncertainty. Secondly, patience must rise in the face of injustice. And thirdly, knowledge of the sovereign God invokes sacrificial surrender. So may these guide us as we go through times of injustice. So firstly, bold wisdom is needed in the face of uncertainty. You see, Paul here had been waiting for his trial date. Remember, you know, two over years before this, he was whisked away from Jerusalem to Caesarea with a promise of a trial. His accusers came, but the case was deferred because the material witnesses did not show up. 
And even he was expected to bribe the government officials to be freed. And all throughout, there was no evidence that was brought against him. And yet, after two years, he was still in prison. There were two failed trials, but no verdict. And here he remained in prison for over 700 plus days. Now, what did Paul do? In the face of all these things, he made a bold request. You know, he basically said, enough is enough. <laughs> you know, Felix, the governor, when he left, he left Paul in prison, all right, so that a new governor, Festus, would have to deal with Paul. But Festus also dragged his feet. You know, we are all entitled to a speedy trial, and there are people who are despite years of waiting with uncertainty. They can't travel. They can't live life. You know, they, they have this uncertainty. And this is what Paul experienced. You know, whether you are waiting a trial or whether you are waiting for some resolution, you can understand how Paul felt. Felix dragged his feet, but also now Festus was dragging his feet. You know, three days after his arrival, he went to Jerusalem. The leaders there requested that Paul be brought to Jerusalem. They want to ambush him en route, verse 3. But Festus was wise enough to deny them this. He said that Paul should stay in Caesarea. And if they wanted to accuse him, they should go to, Jerus uh, they should go to Caesarea. But what we see is that after saying this, in verse 6, Festus stayed in Jerusalem for another 10 days. So he dragged his feet. There was still no speedy trial. Now, when he finally reached Caesarea, he waited yet another day before bringing Paul before him. So Paul waited in prison for a long time. He was already there for two years. Now there's another further delay of 13 days. So that's 745 days waiting, all right? That's a long time. Now, when the accusers finally did come in verse 7, they brought charges they couldn't prove. And in verse 9, Festus was confused. He didn't know what to do. And he suggested to Paul, maybe, Paul, you should go to Jerusalem, and I will, you know, have the court there instead. But do you know why? He suggested this. It says, but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? He didn't care for the prisoner. He wanted to do the Jews a favor. He wanted favor with the Jews. Now, we always think that justice is blind, uh, but is justice blind? It, it is not always blind. It should be blind, but it is not, right? And, and so given this delay, this miscarriage of justice, Paul was now bold. He appealed to Caesar. In verses 10 and 11, Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal to Caesar. So, you know, after all of this, after these two years of ding-donging back and forth, right, you know, Paul said, you want to send me to Jerusalem? But here I am at a Roman court to be judged. I've done no wrong before the Jews. You've heard all the testimony, right, by Claudius Lysias, that there were no charges that were substantial. So I am a Roman citizen, and you suggest that I go back to Jerusalem? No. So you can imagine how he would have spoken, you know, you know probably you know, I'll go only when cows fly. I'll go over when hell freezes over. I'm not going there at all. And so as a Roman citizen seeing the injustice, he now appealed to Caesar, to a higher court. And as a result, what did Festus say? Okay, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. 
Now, as I said before, everyone should be entitled to a speedy trial. But we all know that's just theory. It doesn't always happen. For Paul, it didn't happen. In fact, maybe I'm wrong to say everyone is entitled to a speedy trial. Maybe I only know that from crime dramas. Maybe it doesn't apply here. <laughs> Does it apply here? <laughs> All right. So for Paul, we know that it didn't happen. And so Paul, even though he made a bold request, there was another painful wait. And dearly beloved, you know, we are all going through different trials in our life. Some injustice, something, you know, and we have to at times wait. It doesn't go our way. You know, the systems of the world do not go our way simply because we are believers. In fact, Jesus faced a kangaroo court. So Paul had another painful wait. In verse 13, we learn that after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came. They came to meet with Festus. And so what happened? Festus was busy entertaining. Verse 14 tells us they stayed many days. While they were enjoying the party, right, Paul's transfer was tardy. And so here we see that it was not only unjust, it was also uncertain. And during the party, uh, Festus gave a report to Agrippa. He said, you know, I went to Jerusalem. I met with the chief priests. I offered them a chance of another trial. Uh, but when they came to Caesarea, verse 17, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Now, here Festus has warped reality. He said, without delay, right? I called for him. This is ironic. If there was anything, there was delay, right? There was nothing but delay and uncertainty. But just as Paul had to be bold in making this appeal, he had to be patient because there was still much uncertainty. You know, due process was not happening. But this does show us something. Paul knew enough about what was happening that he appealed to Caesar. He could read the providences, he could read the occurrences, he could read all the flip-flopping, the ding-donging about all the vacillation. But in the midst of this, Paul exercised bold wisdom and patience. And you know, wisdom and patience are related. Dearly beloved, you may be going through a trial, an aspect of injustice, even right now. Due process does not seem to be on the horizon, but be bold and be patient. And Paul needed to be wise and patient because Festus was worse than Felix. Felix wanted a bribe, but Festus wanted to gain favor with the Jews. So secondly, patience must arise in the face of injustice. You know, and what we've seen already is that the people in Caesarea, in Jerusalem, were unjust. You know, Claudius may have sent Paul to Caesarea to keep him safe. Remember, he was about to have him whipped until he knew that Paul was a Roman citizen. All right? That was an injustice. And furthermore, Felix, even though he kept Paul safe from his enemies and uh, kept him in prison, he was al always dangling a carrot in front of Paul, wanting him to bribe him. And here, as we see in verse 9, Festus also had no interest in true justice. He only wanted to gain political favor. Now, he first came, when he first came to Judea, he went to meet with the Sanhedrin as the new governor. He wanted to meet with them to establish good relationship because as we have previously seen, Felix had a disastrous relationship with the Sanhedrin. And so there, uh, when he called Paul to return back to Jerusalem to stand trial, it was because he wanted to please the Jews. 
This was a political move. Now, folks, this is no different. Political moves are common, all right? This was done by Felix. He left Paul in prison. He did not release Paul when his term of governor was over. It was because he did not want the Jews to write a complaint against him. So he left a man in prison for his benefit. Festus wanted to deliver a man for his benefit. Now, why did the Roman governors want to do this? Because uh, the province of Judea was, and Galilee was one of the worst areas for a Roman soldier, a Roman politician to be sent to, to govern. Why? You know, we all have different constituencies in Singapore, right? I'm not going to name which ones are the good or bad ones because I really don't know. But we all know that there are some which are very difficult. All the MPs in that area face a lot of difficulties because of the constituents. So likewise, in those days, right, Judea and Galilee were very difficult because the Jews were known for their obstinacy. It was one of the most troublesome provinces. If you recall, you know, Jesus himself uh, gave an account of the Galileans who were killed in the temple by the Romans, right? If you remember that, because the Jews and the Romans were always in conflict with one another. There were always uprisings. And there was another story that Jesus uh, told about a man who wanted to build a tower. Do you remember that one? And when he built it halfway, he didn't have enough money to finish it. Right? And it, you know, it showed his foolishness. That story was actually a true historical account about Pontius Pilate, right? the governor before Felix, before Festus. He thought he could build a tower and an aqueduct, and when he had run out of money, he decided he would ask the Jews for money through taxes, and also to get money from the temple treasury, from the Corbin of the temple, so that the Jews would part with that religious money. And they were very obstinate, which was right. They did not allow him to. And so the tower stood half built, a testimony of his foolishness. Now, Jesus used it to speak about the foolishness of not counting the cost, but my purpose in bringing this up is to show the relationship between the governors and the Jews. And so, this governor who came after the disaster of Pontius Pilate, of Felix, now he came, he was determined that he would build a good relationship at the start of his career. And how would he do it? <laughs> he would throw Paul under the bus just to satisfy them. It's like, you know, throwing a cat into a pack of dogs, you know, uh, to satisfy them. So this is what Paul had to deal with. Dearly beloved, as Christians, we don't believe in karma, correct? We don't. We don't think that just because we live a life that pleases God, that nothing bad is going to happen. In fact, Jesus says, every man who lives godly in Christ Jesus shall face persecution. And so Paul was facing it. And furthermore, Paul had to bear with Festus because Festus wanted to pervert justice. Now, Paul here was held without formal charges. Festus wanted to hand him over to the Jews. Paul appealed to Caesar, and so now Festus had to send him to Caesar. But the bottom line was this. Festus was probably scratching his head. What charges, ah? Uh? Okay, I send Paul to Caesar because Paul has appealed to Caesar, but what in the world, what charges do I send him there with? He's been accused of something, but there's no evidence. He's innocent, but I've kept him in prison. 
Felix did that. I want to send him back to the Jews to get good relations. Now he's appealed to Caesar, but there are no charges. What should I do? Now, if Festus were to release Paul as he rightly should have, the Jews would riot. But if Festus sent Paul to Caesar, what charge would accompany him? And so that is where King Agrippa came in. Festus told him in verses 15 and 16, the Jews want to have him executed, but, you know, it's against Roman law to execute someone without due process and without a charge. Now, it's not that Festus did not want Paul to be executed. After all, he suggested that Paul go back to Jerusalem. But now that Paul has invoked the name of Caesar, there was still no charge except for a question of religion and custom. So Festus, needing to figure out what kind of charge to invent, right, brought King Agrippa there because King Agrippa would know Jewish law. And so in verse 22, Agrippa agreed to look into the matter. He said, I will also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, thou shalt hear him. So verse 23 the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, they came, and the Bible tells us they came with great pomp, all right? They came with an entourage of people, maybe other experts, and they came to the place of hearing, into the courtroom, and Agrippa meant to do a good thing. There were high-ranking officials with him, and Paul was also brought in. But dearly beloved, I would have you listen to these words again these words that intend to pervert justice in verse 25 to 27. He says, Festus to everyone there, when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I've determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you before you all, especially before you, King Agrippa, after examination that you have done, then uh, I have something to charge him with. It's unreasonable to send a prisoner without a charge, but I'm confident in you that you can invent something. That's exactly what he did. He was perverting justice. Now, as we have said earlier on, if Paul was not guilty, he should have been set free. But Festus wanted to drum up charges against him to pervert justice because, as verse 24 says, the Jews wanted him dead. So if he wanted to hold on to his position for him to have good relations, he needed to get Paul executed if he wanted to advance his career in the core of diplomats, right? He better come up with some trumped up charges to make the Jews happy. So whatever it is here, there was a perversion of justice. Dearly beloved, some of us may be going through something like that. But if you were Paul, how would you feel? 745 days and even more. Some of you might just say, I cut off my nose and send me away. La. Right? But here Paul was patient. Thirdly, knowledge of the sovereign God invokes sacrificial surrender. Did you wonder why Paul appealed to Caesar? Why to this higher court? Yes, maybe because he saw a miscarriage of justice at the lower courts, but it was also his legal right as a Roman citizen. It was his legitimate recourse. But the question that we want to ask is, why Caesar? Why? Now, he appealed to Augustus. Right? It was Augustus Caesar here. But after Augustus Caesar, after a while, it would be Nero. Right? And Nero was an emperor that hated Christians. Paul did not know how the situation would turn about, even though Augustus, Octavian Caesar, was a good ruler, he was also ruthless. The Roman Caesars, the emperors, were not just people. They wanted to expand their empire, 
at whatever cost, even though there were good roads, a good law system, but there was still um, ulterior motive. They're not interested in justice per se. Now, we know subsequently you had such rulers like Nero, uh, who, who were very unkind and great persecutors of Christianity. You know, Nero used to set Christians uh, ablaze so that they could um, light the streets of Rome. He would sew animal hides to the skins of Christians so that the animals in the Colosseum would attack them. So Paul appealed to Caesar, even knowing what the Caesars were like. And the reason why he did this was, as verse 11 says, he was not afraid of dying. He was not afraid to die. Paul said, if he did anything wrong, even a crime that was worthy of the death penalty, he would die for it. He was not fearful of justice, for he was clear in conscience. Even Jesus, Jesus had a bogus charge, and he died from it. And if Christ died from a bogus charge, Paul, a servant of Christ, was not higher than Christ. How could he expect any less? All right? And so he was someone who was a willing soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ, willing to endure hardship. And dearly beloved, patience in the face of trial and injustice is something that we need to cultivate. Now, the reason also why he appealed to Caesar is because he was surrendering to a greater king. He feared not death, but he feared God. If he appealed to Caesar, he would go to Caesar. And why did he want to go to Caesar? Because Caesar was in Rome. And where was Paul's destiny, as Jesus Christ had told him? Not only to suffer in Jerusalem, but also in Rome. So Paul knew that, that that was his destination, that he would preach the gospel there. And so he willingly allowed himself to go where Christ wanted him to go by making this appeal. And going to Rome will mean greater imprisonment. Now, dearly beloved, he surrendered to his fate. There were many people when Paul was en route to Jerusalem who told him, don't go, don't go. You re if you recall, there was the prophet from Jerusalem, Agabus, who came and he took Paul's belt and then he tied Paul's hands with it and he made a prophecy to say, Whoever's hand, whoever hands have been tied with this, the same will be done in Jerusalem. And all the people cried out to Paul and say, don't go, don't go. But Paul said, I have to go. This is God's will. There are many of us here, dearly beloved, who in the face of trial know very likely what are the things that would happen, but we are not surrendered to it. We are fighting and sometimes sinfully, and sometimes in our hearts, we have not surrendered to the sovereign God, but Paul here did. He did not fear death. God was still in control. And here he preached to Agrippa. And Agrippa was not a godly man. He was married to Bernice. All right? Who was Bernice? It was his sister. Agrippa married his sister. And, you know, before this, you know, he had come from a very wicked family. You know, his uncle before him was Antipas, right, who married his brother's wife. His grandfather before that was the one who killed John the baptizer. Before that, his great-grandfather, Herod, was the one who tried to kill Jesus. But yet Paul surrendered to God. Now, folks, what, what are some ways we can apply this passage here to our lives? You know, there is the immediate application 
as I've been saying, there will be many times when the law does not work for us. We won't get justice. There will be no speedy trial. There will be no vindication, no matter how we appeal to a higher court. And in the case of Paul, his faith looked to God. May your faith look to God alone. Maybe some of you are awaiting some kind of judgment. You're unsure of what it will look like. Will you not surrender to God? You know what comfort it was for Paul to have looked to God. He, it, it, it brought to him great boldness. Right? Not only could he appeal to Caesar, but he could confidently say, I'm not afraid to die. But such confidence to, gr- to go to your cross requires that surrender. You know, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane said, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. And when he surrendered himself, when the soldiers came, he said to his disciples, get up the time of my deliverance is at hand. So there's a surrender that we need to cultivate. And dearly beloved, there's also, I suppose, a side application to the church. Whereas in the world, the systems are not always just, God has placed his judicial processes also in his kingdom. When there are disputes and problems, there is due process. And that is why we need men who would not pervert justice. Men who are wise and godly, bold, patient, God-glorifying. Men who are broken and penitent. Men who are surrendered to do God's will and not their own will. Not men who are persecutors, who resort to injustice and lies, you know, who aren't surrendered to due process. You know, for those who are to be officers in the church must follow the great example of our Savior. You know, our Lord Jesus, the very anointed of God, was a shepherd who gently leads his flock. He uses the rod and the staff to comfort them to restore them when they fall, who in the end, he died for the flock that God gave to him in surrender to God's will. And so would you pray, would we pray as a church to ask God for more of such men to be officers? So as we come to another round of nominations, elections, ordinations, You know, we pray that the Lord would impress upon our hearts those that he would call. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious Father in heaven, perchance there's someone here who is facing great uncertainty, issues of injustice, issues of justice, Be merciful to such a person. Deliver such a person. But also help that person to surrender to your will willingly that they may have comfort and boldness in such difficult times. May we also, as a church, know and understand the processes in your kingdom that we would desire men over us who would urge us and hold us accountable to living godly lives before you, men who would shepherd us and help us to look to Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.